It's good to see everyone this evening. <clears throat> Hope you've had a, a good afternoon. <clears throat> Leave your Bibles open, if you would, there to the text of Genesis chapter 19. And <clears throat> by way of uh, some background information here, I want to emphasize the phrase here in verse 16 that Lot lingered. And to really understand the significance of this, you've got to go back into the 13th chapter of Genesis. And you recall that Abraham was a very, I guess today we would say he was a very prosperous cattle farmer or shepherd. He had tremendous flocks and herds, and his nephew Lot also had tremendous flocks and herds. And, and within time, the number of animals they were trying to graze and to water was too much for the land. And you've got to realize that in that part of the world, there's not the abundance of water that we are used to having here in our part of the country. And, and so it was difficult sometimes to find pasture and to find water for all these animals. And in fact, in verses 8 and 9, Abram makes a suggestion to Lot to solve this problem. And he says, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between thy, my herdmen and thy herdsmen. For we be brethren... Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abraham is obviously being very generous here. He's being very noble-hearted because what is he doing? He's giving Lot the first choice. And he could have very easily have said, Now look, Lot, I am God's chosen. God has chosen me to be the father of this nation of people that he is going to build up. And, and so I think it's best for you to pack up and take your flocks and herds and, and just move on to another part of the country because I'm staying here. But he doesn't do that in a very magnanimous way. He tells Lot, look, you choose. If you want to go to the right, then I'll go to the left. If you choose to go to the left, then I'll go to the right. But he was obviously giving Lot the first choice. Lot sadly allowed greed to influence his decision. He looks and he sees the well-watered plain of the Jordan to the east. Great cattle country. Great for flocks and herds. And so uh, selfishly he says, okay, I'll go this way. And you can see Abraham saying, okay, I'll take the other. And verses 10 and 11 tell us that he chose the land that we just referred to here. And I find it interesting, though, and, and, and how much time it took for him to move his family and his flocks and herds there toward the, uh, the Jordan, we're not told. But look at verse uh, 12 there of chapter 13. I find it interesting that Lot doesn't move into Sodom to begin with. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. He had to know something about this wicked city, and Lot, even in that day, was known to be a very immoral city, a very ungodly city, and, and, and probably Lot said, oh no, honey, we're not, gonna, we're not living in Sodom. That place is just too wild for us. We're going to live out here in the suburbs. We're going to live out here in the outskirts. And yet, within time, he's no longer living on the outside, but he's living right in downtown Sodom. We don't have time to go into it tonight, but that says something about the progression of sin. You know, sometimes we start out, oh, well, I would never do this, but we get close, and, and we get closer and closer, and finally we're actually doing what we thought we would never do. We're involved in things that we never thought we would become involved in. Had you asked Lot the day that he left Abraham, are you going to live in Sodom? Oh, no, no, that place is too, too bad for us, too wicked. I would never take my family into the city of Sodom. But over a period of weeks or months or possibly years, we're not given the time frame, but over a period of time, he does move his family right into the heart of the city. And if you look at chapter 13 and verse 13, we read something about just how wicked this place was, uh, the immorality of the inhabitants of the city there. The text says, they were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You say, well, wait a minute, all men sin. Uh, that, that describes every city you can describe. But notice that word exceedingly. Uh, some translation says abundantly. These people were really bad. And if you want to know just how bad they are, look at chapter 19 of Genesis there, beginning in verse 11. When these two angels come to warn Lot, let's just read. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. 
And Lot sat, sat, Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Notice Lot is offering them hospitality. He says, Come stay in my house. And they said, No, we'll just stay out here in the street. Verse 3, And he pressed them greatly. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man, let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do you to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore they came in under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men, that is those two angels, but the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door, and they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both great and small, so that they weary themselves to find the door. We see here a picture of just how immoral and how ungodly these people of Sodom were. In fact, their immorality was so perverted that today we use the term sodomy, which comes from the name of that city. And by the way, just a side note, invariably when you read this, people ask the question, how could Lot have offered his virgin daughters to this mob rather than to allow them to molest his guest? Well, you've got to understand in that culture, someone is a guest in your home That was a tremendous responsibility, not only to care, to provide for their their needs, their shelter, their food, etc., but also to protect them. And so this would have been a terrible disgrace if something had happened to these men while they were staying in Lot's house. Now, we have a hard time comprehending that. But at least that's the explanation that uh, most commentators give as to why he would have offered his daughters uh, in lieu of these men. But it was because of this kind of immorality. And there's no reason to believe this is the first time or the only time that the men of the city tried to engage in such behavior. But it was because of this gross immorality that God says, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom. I'm going to destroy Gomorrah. I'm going to destroy the wicked cities of the plain. And we're not told how many cities there were, but... Obviously, the sinfulness was something that abounded in that area. But God sends these two angels in the form of men to warn Lot what's going to happen, and in essence to say, look, you need to get out of there, you need to leave. Now, common sense would say if two angels came and knocked on your door and said, God is going to destroy the city, you better leave town. You'd think most people would have packed up and left. Immediately, if not sooner. But yet the text there in verse 16 says what? Lot lingered. We know what it means to linger. He took his time. You know, some of the old timers used to say, quit dawdling. He was dawdling. You know, maybe he was looking around, well, am I going to take this? And, you know, I really hate to leave this. And, well, what's going to happen to these possessions and these belongings when we leave? And he was in no hurry to leave. And obviously some of his children and and, and family members did not believe the warning. And that would have been a problem because he's having to leave behind some dear loved ones. We're not told all the reasons. There may have been others. But you know the story, and, and as you look there in the text, the next verse following our text, verse 17, finally those two angels take Lot and his wife and two daughters by the hand and basically escort them out of the city to safety. In verse 17, it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, he said that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. 
their instructions are very clear. Leave. Don't look back. Flee to the mountains. And once again, you think with that warning, Lot would have said, thank you, thank you for warning me. Thank you for getting us out of there. We appreciate it and we're headed for the mountain. But not Lot. He argues with the angels and ultimately with God. Instead of saying, okay, you said go to the mountains, I'm going to. Notice there in verses 18 through 20, he asked permission to do something different, to deviate from God's plan of deliverance. Sounds like a lot of people in the religious world today, doesn't it? God, I know you said do this, but would it be okay if I... And you fill in the blank. Notice verse 18. Lot said unto them, O not so, my Lord. Behold now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee into, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. I don't know about you, but every time I read that verse, the thought runs through my mind. Lot had a lot of gall. It took a lot of nerve to say, God, I know you said flee to the mountain, but let me, let me go to this city. It's a little one. It's not going to matter. Let, let me go there and live. And of course... God granted that wish. God allowed him to do that. And before we're too harsh or too quick to condemn Lot for his lingering, I would suggest to you that we all have a tendency to linger, to procrastinate sometimes, doing what needs to be done, especially if it's something unpleasant, maybe something that we really are not looking forward to doing. We're bad about putting off, right? Why do today what I can do tomorrow is our philosophy. I remember during the Revolutionary War reading about a Hessian general. His name was Rawl. And one night, General Rawl was playing cards with his men, and, and someone came in and handed him a folded piece of paper and said, I have a message for you, General. He said, I'll read it later, and he stuck it in his pocket. And the message that was written on that piece of paper was warning General Rawl that General George Washington and his troops were crossing the river and they were going to attack Trenton, New Jersey. Well, General Rawl did read that note. But he read it after he had been captured and was a prisoner of war. You see, he procrastinated reading a warning that could have changed the outcome of the battle. Procrastination has been the ruin of, of, of many people. And, and there are some things we need to procrastinate. Obviously, you don't rush into getting married. You don't rush into choosing a career or maybe choosing to change careers in midstream. I'm not talking about those things. But there are other things that we should not procrastinate. If you're in a building and suddenly the, alarm, the, the fire alarm goes off and someone starts to yell, fire, fire, you're not going to look around and say, well, you know... Uh, let me finish what I'm doing and I'll get out, I'll leave. No, you need to get out. If the waters, the flood waters are rising around your house and you've been warned, look, we're expecting waters to continue to rise, you need to get out, you don't procrastinate. And many other examples of things that, that we need to do. And in the spiritual realm, even more important, when we learn what we need to do, when we realize that we're lost and what to do to be saved, we shouldn't procrastinate obeying, doing what needs to be done. I think it is so interesting as we study the story of Lot. There is a great parallel there between his situation and ours. Lot was in a situation where he was going to be doomed. Because God was going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain with fire and brimstone. And Lot would have been destroyed along with them except for the love, the mercy, and the grace of God. Just as we were doomed to be destroyed, to be lost in hell because of sin. But for the grace, the mercy, and the love of God, just as God sent the angels to warn Lot, God sent the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, the prophet John, and ultimately his son, not only to warn, to provide, to provide a way of redemption. And yet how many people, when they hear that warning, do exactly what Lot did and, and procrastinate? Well, yes, I know we've got to leave, and we're going to leave. Just give us time. Lot didn't want to leave some things behind, I'm sure. And, and many people in the world don't want to leave things behind, whether it's their habits, uh, whether it's immoral associates, evil associates. 
whatever it might be. There are people, that, well, I'd like to be a Christian, but I don't want to have to do this. Well, I'd obey the gospel, but yeah, I like doing these things. I like these activities. So there's a lot of similarity there. But not only that, we see the mercy of God extended. Not only when Lot procrastinated leaving, God held off to strong the city. He allowed God, uh, Lot to change his plan and say, look, can I flee to this little city instead of going to the mountain? We see the mercy of God loud and clear. And so it is God has extended his mercy to us how many times? that we look and we see the mercy of God shown to us when, when we didn't deserve it any more than Lot deserved it. We also see another warning we mentioned a moment ago is the angels tell Lot to flee. One of the things they said was, don't look back. We didn't read these verses, but I know you remember what happened. Lot's wife looked back, and for whatever reason, we're not told. Maybe she's thinking about her children she left behind and, and, and family and friends. Maybe she's thinking about her belongings, that beautiful home they had. For whatever reason, she turns and looks back. She disobeys, and she's turned into a pillar of salt. But she had been warned. God meant what he said when he said, don't look back. And when God tells us there's certain things that we're not to do or punishment will occur, God means what he says. And some, even some Christians have this idea that on the day of judgment, God's going to say, oh, well, look, I'm a God of love, and, and you know, it's really not that important that you did or didn't do certain things. And forget it. Everybody just come on into heaven. That's the way a lot of people view it. Yes, God is a God of love and mercy, but at the same time, He has always been a God who has done what He said, to bless those who obey, to punish those who disobey. And Lot's wife learned that lesson the hard way. And how many people are going to stand before God in judgment and learn the hard way that God meant what He said when He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? How many are going to learn the hard way that God meant what He said when He says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life? Revelation 2 and verse 10. Yes, the mercy of God is true, it's important, it's wonderful. But the mercy of God does not override the justice of God. When one willfully refuses to obey or willfully disobeys what God has commanded, what God has instructed. The story of Lot is truly a sad one, isn't it? And it all began with a greedy decision to take the best land for himself and then to allow himself to move closer and closer into what was a bad situation. What if Lot had chosen the other place? What if Lot had chosen to remain outside of Sodom and rather or Sodom rather than moving in to the city as he did? There's so many what ifs. And perhaps Lot, as, as, as the years passed by, looked back and said, oh, it would have been so different. Maybe I wouldn't have lost my children. Maybe I wouldn't have lost my wife. If only I had. But that didn't change the situation. Just as today, we can look back and say, well, what if? If only I had done this, or if only I had not done that, how different my life would be. I hope you'll think about Lot in the coming days. I think there are a lot of great lessons, even some that we've not even talked about today, that, that can benefit us if we'll take the time to think about them. But don't be like Lot and procrastinate, put off your obedience to Christ if you're not a Christian. Don't say, I'll do it next Sunday or I'll do it next month or whatever. Do it today. Do it right now while you have the time and the opportunity. We, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what opportunities we're going to be given. Now is the only time we have. Now is the only opportunity that we can be sure of. Tonight, if you desire to become a child of God through faith, repenting and turning from your sins, confessing his name, and being buried with him in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, you can become a child of God, and you can have the hope and the promise of eternal life. If you need to respond to this invitation tonight, let me encourage you to come while we stand and while we sing.